Welcome to lecture number nine. The age of Jefferson will explore our nation's third president and events associated with his administration and the War of 1812. There are several important themes to be discussed in this presentation. The first includes a profile of Thomas Jefferson's outlook and his accomplishments. Secondly, the lecture will describe important events such as Marbury versus Madison and the Louisiana Purchase. Finally, the causes and consequences of American involvement in the War of 1812 will be discussed. As the leading figure of this era, it's fitting to begin this presentation with the profile of Thomas Jefferson. He was clearly a man of the Enlightenment. He could read Greek and Latin, and even designed his own mansion, Monticello. He loved to invent things, and popularized the item shown here, the polygraph, which made copies of his letters. On a personal level, he was actually quite shy. He was tall as he stood about six foot two inches in height, with flaming red hair, but he wasn't the greatest public speaker. He sent his State of the Union address to Congress, rather than delivering it himself in a tradition which would last until Woodrow Wilson became president. He also surprised many visitors by wearing casual clothing and slippers. His career in public life was quite impressive. While a member of the Continental Congress, he became the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. He also served as governor of Virginia. He had a background in foreign affairs as he was an ambassador to France and Washington's Secretary of State. For four years, he also served as vice president under John Adams. However, he was also a man of many contradictions. Jefferson was an advocate of the common man, yet he lived in a lavish mansion, Monticello, and spent incredible amounts of money on frivolous items such as wine and a French cook. He wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal, yet he owned numerous slaves. He advocated the government should have a limited set of powers, but he expanded the government's powers with the purchase of Louisiana. Finally. He wrote there should be no intermixture between the races, yet there is evidence he had a relationship with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings. Accusations concerning alleged relations with one of his slaves were part of the election of 1800, but were first published in 1802. Since then, historians showed Jefferson was present at Monticello nine months before the birth of Hemings' children. Then, in the 1990s, DNA testing appeared to settle this question by proving that Jefferson had fathered at least one of Sally Hemings' children. Jefferson was a widower, and Hemings was his late wife's half-sister. Yet maybe this deed above all others demonstrates the true contradiction of Jefferson's words versus his actions. The election of 1800 proved to be one of the ugliest in American history, as there was a great deal of mudslinging back and forth between the Federalists and supporters of Jefferson. In 1799, President John Adams angered many in his party by seeking peace with France. This caused a rift in the Federalist Party. There wasn't much of an independent press, as supporters of Jefferson wrote that Adams supported a monarchy and wanted to attack individual liberties, while Jefferson was labeled an atheist and supporter of radicalism in France. In the end, this turned out to be a close election, but Adams was defeated. Thomas Jefferson was able to win the votes of the southern states, while his running mate, Aaron Burr, proved crucial in securing the votes from New York. Once again, problems developed with the Constitution and came into play. If the team of Jefferson and Burr won, Jefferson was supposed to serve as president, with Burr acting as vice president. However, as you can see from this map, Burr and Jefferson tied with 73 electoral votes each. This sent the election to the House of Representatives. In an ironic twist, because Federalists made up a majority in the House of Representatives, they would have the power to choose the next president. However, their choice was between Jefferson and Burr, each of whom were their enemies. They were initially deadlocked, but after several ballots, Thomas Jefferson was named the winner. Part of the reason why Jefferson won the presidency was due to the actions of Alexander Hamilton. While there was no love loss between he and Jefferson, Hamilton convinced some to support Jefferson as Hamilton saw him as the lesser of two evils. Burr and Hamilton were bitter enemies. Later in 1804, while still serving as Vice President of the United States, Burr and Hamilton would fight in a duel. Hamilton died, while Burr's political career was destroyed. For more information about this famous duel, click on the hyperlink below. 
to avoid another controversy in future presidential elections, the Twelfth Amendment was passed. This called for presidential electors to cast separate ballots for president and vice president. Possibly the most important result of this election was the fact that after a very controversial campaign, there was a peaceful transfer of power from one political party to another. It demonstrated this American experiment in democracy was working. Once in office, Jefferson hoped to establish his own set of policies, but one of the first items he had to deal with concerned the court system. Near the end of Adams' presidency, he named several Federalists to positions within the judicial branch in hopes that his party could continue to control at least one branch in the government. Taken together, these were labeled the Midnight Appointments. This was controversial, but a legal question developed involving one such appointee. His name was William Marbury. William Marbury was set to become a Justice of the Peace for Washington, D.C. However, he never received the commission granting him this appointment. James Madison, whose responsibility it was to deliver such appointments, as he was Jefferson's new Secretary of State, refused to deliver the documentation. Marbury sued Madison on the grounds that the Judiciary Act of 1789 allowed the Supreme Court to issue rulings requiring the delivery of such paperwork. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was John Marshall, another of Adams' midnight appointees. Ironically, he was supposed to have delivered the letter to Marbury, but had failed to do so. He was also a distant cousin of Thomas Jefferson. He was put in a difficult position. If he ruled in Marbury's favor and granted him his position, Jefferson would surely ignore the ruling, thereby regulating the Supreme Court to a position of irrelevance compared to the other branches. In 1803, Justice Marshall issued his famous decision in the case Marbury v. Madison. He argued that ethically, Madison should deliver the commission, however the courts could not require him to do so. They couldn't require its delivery because the Constitution never gave the courts the power to issue such rulings. The section of the Judiciary Act empowering the courts to make such judgments was unconstitutional. In the short run, Marshall's ruling denied the courts the minor power to force the delivery of legal paperwork, such as the appointments. However, in the long run, it established the very important power of judicial review. This is the power of our courts to review the constitutionality of laws passed by Congress. This was incredibly important for the history of the nation, as it put the Supreme Court on equal footing with the other three branches of government at the national level. In 1800, officials in the United States began to hear rumors that France had regained control of the Louisiana Territory. This set into motion a series of events which eventually resulted in the purchase of Louisiana. By 1802, it was clear the French had regained control. This was confirmed when restrictions were placed on American access to the port of New Orleans. If you remember, Pinckney's Treaty had secured America's right to the free access of New Orleans. If American access to New Orleans was cut off permanently, it would deliver a serious blow to farmers living in the West and South who shipped their goods down the Mississippi. Prior to the French and Indian War, French holdings in North America encompassed all of the Louisiana Territory. Having Spain control this vast empire was one thing. They were a declining power. Once the French regained possession, Jefferson was worried. France was on the rise, with Napoleon at the nation's helm. Jefferson felt he must act quickly. So in early 1803, he authorized the American minister in France, Robert Livingston, to spend up to $2 million to purchase the port city of New Orleans and as much surrounding territory as possible. Livingston was shocked when the French offered to sell all of Louisiana. In what would not be the final time a bureaucrat would spend more money than he was authorized to spend, Livingston agreed to purchase the Louisiana territory for $15 million. This just about doubled the size of the United States. Fifteen million was an enormous sum of money at the time, yet it's estimated this land deal cost the United States about three cents an acre. Unbeknownst to the United States, Napoleon had recently given up his goal of a new world empire. This happened because of events on the island of Santo Domingo, modern-day Haiti. The island's leader was Toussaint L'Ouverture, a former slave who led a successful rebellion in the 1790s, overthrowing the European powers. Napoleon sent troops to reclaim the island in 1802. The French were defeated by yellow fever as much as the military prowess of L'Overture's forces. Having lost in the Caribbean, Napoleon hoped to use the money from the sale of Louisiana for his upcoming war in Europe. 
These series of events help to explain Napoleon's sale of Louisiana. This map shows American expansion from 1800 to 1860. The solid green segment shows the original 13 states and territories, while the area in the outline shows the Louisiana Territory. It included much of the interior of today's United States, not just the state of Louisiana. No one was sure exactly what was out there or the true western border of American territory, yet this was an incredibly large tract of land. As a believer in a strict interpretation of the Constitution, Jefferson was troubled by the fact the Constitution did not provide steps for the purchase of new territories. He initially considered a constitutional amendment to fix this omission, but decided against it as he was concerned Napoleon might change his mind. He then submitted the purchase to Congress as he believed it was the best thing for the nation. The purchase of Louisiana was popular among many in the public at large. The nation next had to determine what it had actually bought from the French. Even before the Louisiana Purchase, President Jefferson hoped to finance a mission to explore the West. Eventually, Congress authorized the Corps of Discovery. The two leaders were Meriwether Lewis, Jefferson's personal secretary, and William Clark, an army officer and explorer. The group was small, with only 27 other members, including Clark's slave, York. Lewis and Clark had several goals. Jefferson wanted this to be a scientific expedition. They were to provide specific descriptions of the land as well as plant and animal life. Tools, like the standard surveyor's chain shown here, were used to create accurate maps, but they also studied the land for its economic potential. They were also charged with learning as much as they could about Native Americans. To facilitate this, Lewis and Clark brought with them over 20 bags of gifts for Indian leaders. Members of the expedition set out in May of 1804 from St. Louis. St. Louis is circled on the map. Their charge was to follow the course of the Missouri River northward, as shown in red. The first year's winter was spent at Fort Mandan among the Mandan Indians in North Dakota. Over the course of the entire journey, they came into contact with many Native Americans. With the Mandans, they hunted together, traded with one another, and socialized together in many ways. This intimate socialization allowed them to make first-hand observations of the way in which they lived, even if it did lead to some misunderstandings between the two groups. They continued their journey in 1805 and made it to the Pacific Ocean by November, spending the next winter at Fort Clatsop in Oregon. Their second winter was also positive. However, while in Oregon, they often complained in their journals about the gray skies and almost constant rain. In 1806, they returned home. Overall, this was a very successful journey. The trip was facilitated by the presence of Sacagawea, the Shoshone wife of their guide and interpreter, Charbonneau. She played an important role as a translator and was familiar with some of the geography of the region. The mere presence of a woman with a newborn child sent an important message this was a, an expedition of peace rather than a war party. The expedition led to several important results for the nation. First, their observations of the land, including plant and animal life, proved helpful for future travelers. They were able to provide detailed descriptions of the flora and fauna they encountered and developed important maps like the one shown here. This was a map of their travels drawn by William Clark. His description of the Rockies was accurate for the most part, but the Southwest was less accurate. While their descriptions of Native Americans may have included bias, they contained helpful information about the ways in which Indians lived. This was important for people living in the early 19th century, but also for many anthropologists and historians today. Finally, their winter spent on the Pacific Ocean helped strengthen American claims to Oregon and Washington. The Oregon country, shown in yellow and circled on this map, eventually became the United States Territory by the 1840s. The fact that members of the expedition built a fort, spent a winter, and mapped this area added to American claims. For more information about the Lewis and Clark expedition, you may click on the hyperlink below.
Some have called the War of 1812 the Second War for American Independence. We'll investigate some of the background to this war next. There were several factors which led to war between the Americans and the British in the War of 1812. The first dealt with trading rights and the impressment of American sailors. Following the return of war in Europe in 1803, American rights as neutral trading powers became an issue. Over the first years of the war, Americans benefited as the United States supplied grain and other supplies to Europe. However, in 1805, both the British and French attempted to block each other's trade. They each seized American ships and their cargoes if they were caught trading with the other nation. As if that wasn't bad enough, there was the impressment of American sailors by the British. Because the pay for sailors was low and working conditions were horrid, some British sailors jumped ship and joined American vessels where conditions were better. The Royal Navy began stopping American ships looking for deserters. Sometimes former British subjects were forced to return, but it's estimated about 6,000 American citizens, like the one shown in this image, were victims of impressment between 1803 and 1812. This also led to the Chesapeake Leopard Affair in 1807. The USS Chesapeake, an American warship, refused to be boarded by the Leopard, a British frigate. The British ship fired at close range, leaving three Americans dead and wounding several others. Four deserters were seized, three of which had become American citizens. The Chesapeake Leopard Affair left many in the United States calling for war. In response to this confrontation and hoping to avoid war, Jefferson supported the Embargo Act. This act prohibited all American exports to any country. Jefferson hoped the French and British would be so dependent upon American exports they would be forced to respect American shipping and neutrality. It was incredibly unpopular and just didn't work. While smuggling did take place, unemployment skyrocketed. James Madison followed Jefferson into the presidency in 1809. He supported an easing of the trade embargo, but American ships continued to be seized by both the French and British. However, because the British ruled the seas, Americans turned their anger toward the British rather than the French. Another cause of the War of 1812 dealt with British interaction with Native Americans living in the Northwest Territory. As more settlers moved westward in the early 1800s, they once again came into conflict with Native Americans in the Old Northwest. One objection many Indian leaders had was that American officials would sometimes negotiate treaties with individuals who had no authority to engage in treaty making. There were also repeated violations of treaties by American settlers. One Indian leader upset at these events was the Shawnee Chief Tecumseh. Tecumseh was an experienced warrior with natural charisma who worked with his brother, a religious leader named the Prophet, toward a goal of creating an Indian confederacy. Tecumseh hoped to include Native Americans not just from the Ohio Valley, but from Canada to the American South. He encouraged Indian settlement in towns such as Tippecanoe as a challenge to the Americans. This map identifies the numerous Indian groups, many of which were allied with Tecumseh as he sought to create his Confederation of Indian Nations. The arrow points to the location of the Tippecanoe settlement. William Henry Harrison, the governor of Indiana Territory, raised concerns about Tecumseh's plans and the resistance to American settlement. While Tecumseh was recruiting support in the South, the Prophet called for his supporters to attack Harrison's forces near Tippecanoe. Indian forces were outnumbered, and Harrison's men burned the town. This made Harrison the hero of Tippecanoe and convinced Tecumseh that he must ally with the British in his efforts to stop American expansion. As tension rose between the Americans and the British on the seas, Native Americans and the British in the West drew closer to one another. This is seen in the image shown here of two Ottawa chiefs proudly displaying their British medals. Harrison called for war not only against Tecumseh, but the British as well. A final factor which led to war was the election of a new class of congressmen, some of which were called War Hawks. Warhawk was the name given to members of Congress who were vocal supporters of war with Britain. They were strongest in the South and West. Among others, they were led by John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay. Some even called for the annexation of Canada. By themselves, the Warhawks would not have led the United States into war. But with other issues raising conflict, 
They were an added factor which led to war. Debate in Congress was quite bitter. Opposition to war with Britain was strongest where the Federalists were most popular, particularly the New England states and New York. However, in June of 1812, President Madison sent a message to Congress listing American grievances with the British. By the end of the month, the United States had issued its first declaration of war. War critics labeled this Mr. Madison's War. Fighting in the war lasted over two years. We'll explore some important battles next. Several forays by the Americans into Canada were unsuccessful in 1812. One led to the surrender of Fort Detroit. However, Oliver Perry defeated the British at Put-in Bay in 1813, giving the Americans control of Lake Erie. Tecumseh was also killed while fighting against the Americans in 1813. At the Battle of Bladensburg, included in the circled area of the map, American forces were routed by the British, who then went on to the nation's capital. While in Washington, D.C., the British burned the presidential mansion and several other buildings. They withdrew the next day, but not before the Capitol building was badly damaged as well. This image shows the British sack of Washington. Meanwhile, American negotiators met with British officials in Ghent, Belgium. There they agreed to end hostilities between the two countries. However, neither impressment of sailors nor shipping rights were discussed in the treaty. The issue became moot by this time as fighting in Europe had already ended. Essentially, the treaty restored British-American relations to what they had been before the war. Negotiations were complete December 24, 1814, but it took nearly two months for news to reach the United States. In the meantime, fighting raged in the South. In January of 1815, Andrew Jackson led a ragtag group of forces against 6,000 British troops. By the end of the fighting, the British suffered 2,000 casualties as compared to 21 for the Americans. The Battle of New Orleans, which actually took place after the peace agreement had been reached, was a great symbolic victory for the Americans. In the winter of 1814-15, to 15, several Federalists met in Hartford, Connecticut to discuss their grievances with the war. Some even talked of secession from the Union, yet their proposals were more moderate. Among others, they supported constitutional amendments requiring a two-thirds vote of Congress to declare war and, in what was clearly aimed at the Virginia dynasty of Jefferson and Madison, wanted to prohibit the election of two presidents in a row from the same state. When news of Jackson's victory and the Treaty of Ghent reached the public, the convention became a death blow for the Federalists as they were seen as traitors to the nation. There are a few final concepts which can now be addressed. One result of the events which took place during this era was the emergence of several symbols of American nationalism. There were three symbols of this emerging nationalism. First, after the presidential mansion was damaged following the British invasion, its walls were painted white, leading to the appearance of a White House. While observing the Battle of Fort McHenry as a prisoner on a British ship, Francis Scott Key wrote the words to the Star-Spangled Banner, which was later set to music and became the country's national anthem. And, with his victory at New Orleans, Andrew Jackson became a national hero. In the future, he would serve two terms as President of the United States. Two additional themes were addressed in this lecture. The figure of Thomas Jefferson and some of his achievements were discussed. Overall, how would you evaluate this man of many contradictions? Finally, you should be able to evaluate the causes and consequences of the War of 1812 for the nation. This concludes lecture number nine. The next few slides will include hyperlinks to websites with additional information as well as sources used to develop this lecture. I hope you found this presentation to be helpful.